Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element tungsten. For once, I have a sample of the element that's large enough. We don't have to use a magnifier to see it. Here, as a matter of fact, is a large sample of tungsten. This block, even though it's kind of a small size, actually weighs 12 pounds. And that's not the only sample I have for the beginning here. I also have this giant 750 watt light bulb. And if you look closely enough, you can see the filament there is also made of tungsten. But let's get back to our slides. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Tungsten is the 74th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 74 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. In 1871, Carl Scheele discovered a new acid could be made from a mineral called tungsten, now named after him and called scheelite. Scheelite is calcium tungstate. Scheele and Tobern Bergman believed they could extract a new metal by reducing this acid. They never accomplished this goal. Two years later, in 1873, two brothers, Fausto and Jose Elujar, produced an identical acid from a different mineral, wolframite, an iron manganese tungstate. They were able to reduce the acid with charcoal and obtained the actual metallic element. They, therefore, get the credit for the discovery of tungsten and eventually a postage stamp in Spain. There are a few pure versions of the tungstate minerals aside from wolframite. There's ferberite, which is iron tungstate, and hubnerite, which is a manganese tungstate. The original name for scheelite was tungsten from the Swedish for heavy stone. Tung translates to heavy and sten to stone. Indeed, virtually any mineral with a substantial amount of tungsten is going to be heavy. Tungsten is the name used for the element in the United States and many other countries, and is indeed the official name according to the IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. However, from that other mineral we've seen, wolframite, Swedish chemist Johan Valerius gave the element another name, Wolfram, which is still used in many countries. This is why the symbol for the element is W. I know this is somewhat trivial, but there are 14 elements with a single letter designation, most of which we've already covered in this series. After tungsten, we only have one more single-lettered element in Tales from the Periodic Table, element 92, uranium, which I hope to get to in about a year and a half. Most of the world's tungsten is mined in China, which supplies 80% of the global need. Other sources are Vietnam with 6%, Mongolia, Russia, North Korea, and Bolivia, all with around 2%, and everybody else combined makes up the remaining 6%. Tungsten is a part of a large group in the middle of the periodic table called the transition metals. This section of the periodic table is where we fill the d electron orbital of the respective atoms. Tungsten is a silvery gray metal. Here you see below the one centimeter cube some actual crystals of tungsten deposited on tungsten rods. This must have been very difficult to make given the high melting and vaporization temperatures of this element, which we'll get to in a bit. The element tungsten is very uncommon in the universe. 
Coming in as the 72nd most abundant element in the universe by mass, only five parts per 10 billion, right near the bottom of this chart. A little more abundant in the sun, it makes up four billionths of its mass and is the 44th most abundant element there. It's the 63rd most abundant element in meteorites at 12 parts per 100 million. Surprisingly common compared to everywhere else, in the crust of the Earth, it's the 59th most common element at 1.1 parts per million. A lot more common than silver at 7.9 parts per 100 million. Tungsten is the 50th most abundant element in the ocean, a very difficult to detect 12 parts per 100 billion. And lastly, like most of the elements in the upper reaches of the periodic table, there is no tungsten in us. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Tungsten is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just tungsten a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang until now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of tungsten created by various processes. About one half of tungsten present today is believed to be produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, and the other half is produced in supernovae, the yellow area, a very small proportion that green icing on top is produced in neutron star mergers. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 74 protons for tungsten, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 36 isotopes of tungsten, and of these, there are four stable non-radioactive isotopes. These four stable isotopes are found in different proportions in nature, from a little more than 14% to over 30%. But if you look carefully, you'd notice that these four don't add up to 100%, only 99.88%. The missing 0.12% is a long-lived radioactive isotope, tungsten 180, which we'll see in the next slide. Adding this in gives us our 100%. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek, isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of tungsten occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of tungsten, these eight are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. We'll talk about what a half-life is in the next slide. The longest lasting isotope is tungsten 180 with an eye-popping half-life of 1.8 times 10 to the 18th years or 1.8 quintillion years. That's 13 million times the age of the universe. It may be radioactive, but just barely so. In one gram of this isotope, there are only two decays per year. This stuff is still around because, well, it hasn't had time to decay away. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slides. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2 and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, 
half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. As with most elements, the price of tungsten varies widely with purity and the quantity you buy. Tungsten goes for around $45 per kilogram. Because of its density, you don't get a lot of tungsten volume-wise for a given weight. For instance, my two and a quarter inch tungsten cube has a mass around 3.5 kilograms, or about eight pounds. This stuff is shockingly dense. I guess that means my cube is worth around $150. By the way, I'd like to thank Varian for providing this tungsten sample. We'll see a bit later how Varian uses tungsten. Tungsten has a very high density at 19.25 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you here as well. You can see that tungsten is almost exactly the same as gold. In fact, Counterfeiters have used blocks of gold-plated tungsten to pull off scams since gold-coated tungsten ingots are a lot cheaper than pure gold. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, tungsten's density is 19.25 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle. It's the eighth densest element. Being one of the refractory metals I'll discuss in a bit, tungsten has the extremely high melting point of 3,422 degrees Celsius or 6,191 degrees Fahrenheit. It has the second highest melting point of the elements. Number one, carbon, melts at a slightly higher temperature, but that's for the diamond form. Apparently, you can melt tungsten with a TIG welding apparatus. In this demonstration, the tungsten is melted in a chilled copper block. Inert gas streaming from the TIG welder keeps the tungsten from oxidizing in the air. You're seeing this through a welder's dark helmet filter, which gives the video a greenish color cast. I'll talk more about TIG welding, which also involves tungsten in a bit. See the nice little bead of melted and solidified tungsten? Tungsten boils at a blistering 5,555 degrees Celsius, or 10,031 degrees Fahrenheit, making it the second highest boiling point of all the elements, only bested by our next element in this series, rhenium. That's a whopping 2,133 degrees Celsius above its melting point. Tungsten has the 17th largest liquid temperature range of all the elements. The high melting point makes tungsten a member of a class of metals called refractory metals. These metals are extraordinarily resistant to heat and wear. They all share some properties, including a melting point above 2,000 degrees Celsius and high hardness at room temperature. They're relatively chemically inert and have high densities. 
Though not quite as tough as the classic refractory metals we just discussed, some of the other transition metals surrounding our central group share some of the same qualities, but to a somewhat lesser extent. Note that technetium is not included in this group since it must be made artificially and is highly radioactive. If we compare the size of the tungsten atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The tungsten atom is about 3.6 times the size of hydrogen. Here's its electronic structure. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are impressively small. Looking at all the element atom sizes, here we see them sorted from largest, cesium at the top left, to smallest, helium on the bottom right. Tungsten has the 25th largest size atom of the elements. Tungsten is hard stuff, coming in at 7.5 on Mohs scale of hardness, about the same as emerald. A compound of tungsten, tungsten carbide, is even harder at 9.0 to 9.5, very close to diamond. Here's a chart of the element hardness from hardest, boron on the left, to the softest, cesium on the right. Obviously, I'm not including liquids or gases here. Tungsten is the third hardest element between chromium and osmium. Tungsten has the next to the lowest rate of thermal expansion of all the elements, only 4.5 parts per million per Celsius degree. This means that if you had a one meter long bar of tungsten and you heated it by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by only 4.5 millionths of a meter, less than one-tenth the diameter of a human hair. A pretty low expansion rate. Tungsten would be great for making stable telescope mirrors, except for the fact that it's so dense it would be nearly impossible to support, and forget about launching something like that into orbit. It's so dense and heavy. That's why the James Webb telescope mirrors are made from beryllium. It may expand a bit more with temperature, but it's so light we have a chance of actually launching it. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Tungsten has a moderately complex set of emission lines, mostly in the green through violet part of the spectrum. If I increase the contrast, you can see this more plainly. These emission colors uniquely identify it as tungsten to scientists. No other element gives off this set of colors. Let's take a look at a few applications of tungsten. Many of these are for its high melting refractory nature. Some applications are for its incredible density. But there are major electronic applications and a few medical applications as well. Our first and probably best known application of tungsten is its use in the filaments of incandescent light bulbs. Because of its extremely high melting point, you can raise the temperature of tungsten high enough until it's glowing white hot. The bulb is slightly evacuated and filled with a low pressure gas such as argon or nitrogen to keep the filament from oxidizing and burning out. Some tungsten lamps get so hot they must be encased in quartz envelopes. These lamps are so hot and white, the tungsten tends to slowly evaporate from the filament and deposit on the quartz, reducing its transparency. A bit of iodine inside the lamp causes any deposited tungsten to redeposit back on the filament. These are called quartz halogen lamps. Most tungsten filament lamps have now been outlawed, since only 5% of the energy put into them produces light. They've been replaced mostly by either fluorescent lamps, which convert 20 to 35% of the input energy into light, or LED bulbs, which convert 40 to 50% of the input energy to light. The rest of the energy goes into heat, so even LED bulbs aren't bad heaters but incandescent tungsten bulbs are definitely better heaters than light sources. Tungsten carbide is one of the hardest substances aside from diamonds. 
It's easily fashioned into cutting tools like you see here. Most of the time, only the cutting edges of these tools are made of tungsten carbide, or inserts of tungsten carbide are bolted to softer steel tools. Here, you see a saw blade with small tungsten carbide cutting pieces attached to the steel blade itself. Though I have no idea how to shape this extremely hard material, jewelers somehow make rings from ultra-hard tungsten carbide. Note, you should be careful not to allow your finger to grow within this ring so it won't slip off anymore. These can't be removed by cutting them off. Using tungsten for your darts allows you to have a heavy dart while keeping it slim to offer less air resistance. Personally, I think this is taking things a bit far. However, if you are an aficionado and are willing to pay $50 for three darts, who am I to question it? If you want to increase the inertia of your golf club and give an additional oomph to the ball when struck, you could always tape one of these tungsten faces to your club. Again, in my opinion, it seems like cheating, but at least it's cheating using physics. While we're still in the sporting goods department, you can get tungsten fishing weights to replace the older and toxic lead weights that have been used in the recent past. Of course, due to the hardness and density of tungsten, it has its military purposes as well, such as this armor piercing and exploding shell. Tungsten is probably a better choice than armor-piercing depleted uranium shells since it doesn't pollute the environment with poisonous and radioactive waste. This ordnance is used in rapid-fire guns you'll find mounted on many Navy vessels. Tungsten is used as the electrode in TIG welding. TIG stands for Tungsten Inert Gas. Here we see a TIG welding torch. Let's look at it close up, welding some stainless steel. TIG welding uses an electric arc from the tungsten electrode. The electric arc creates high temperatures to melt the target metal together. It does this in a stream of inert gas to prevent oxidation. TIG welding can weld more exotic metals like stainless steel, aluminum, nickel alloys, and others. Again, because of tungsten's high melting point, you can use it as a vessel to melt or vaporize other substances. This is a tungsten evaporation boat on top and a tungsten basket similar to a lamp filament below. You place the substance you want to evaporate in the small hollow in the boat or basket and pass a high current through the tungsten, heating it up. The substance vaporizes and coats nearby surfaces, like a mirror being coated with vaporized aluminum. Other refractory metals, such as tantalum and molybdenum, are also used for this application. Here's how it works. A tungsten boat or basket is attached to electrodes that pass through a steel plate. A small amount of material you want to deposit is placed in the boat or basket. If you're making a mirror, this would probably be aluminum. You mount your piece of glass, also called a substrate, above the boat. This process must occur in a vacuum, so we place a bell jar over the whole apparatus. A vacuum pump attached to the hole in the center of the plate removes the air. Now we pass a current through the boat or basket, heating it to glowing incandescent temperatures hot enough to melt and vaporize the aluminum. The aluminum atoms spray out from the boat and coat everything they hit, including the glass substrate, giving it a silvery coating, thus producing a mirror. These are front surface mirrors with the delicate silvery coating on the top surface, unlike your bathroom mirror with the silvery coating on the back surface protected by the glass. X-ray tubes make their X-rays by accelerating electrons to smash into a dense metal target. In many cases, that target is made from tungsten. 
This block of tungsten is designed not to produce x-rays, but rather to block x-rays. It's about the size of two common bricks, but is so dense it weighs 40% of what I weigh. Four of those blocks are used in one of the most interesting machines I've seen, called the Varian True Beam Radiotherapy System. This machine is used to target cancer tumors with a beam of high-intensity x-rays produced with a linear accelerator within the system. The tumor is at the intersection of the x-rays from the machine as it rotates around the patient, and hence the tumor receives the highest dose while the surrounding tissue receives a smaller dose. This isn't enough, though. It would be better if the beam were restricted in size so it only exposed the tumor itself. We start with the four blocks of tungsten. I was allowed to photograph an open machine on the factory floor of Varian. We're looking into the machine where the x-rays are emitted. Notice the four blocks of tungsten? They can be moved during treatment to limit the size of the beam to more closely match the size of the tumor. This happens continuously as the machine rotates around the patient. But Varian was not finished finessing the beam yet. There's an additional set of interleaved tungsten blades that further shape the beam as the machine rotates around the patient. The tumor was previously measured via CT or MRI scan, so the radiologists know its 3D shape, and this is programmed into the true beam. You are only seeing a test pattern here on the factory floor. This is a truly amazing, life-saving technology. Thanks to Varian for the amazing access we were given to show you this use of tungsten. Aside from a tiny bit, possibly absorbed from the environment, your body does not use tungsten, and it has no known biological functions. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about tungsten. Illuminated the 20th century, glowing with such pride. In the next program in this series, I'll examine another high-melting refractory element, rhenium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element tungsten.